everyone. We're so delighted that you're here today, and we're so delighted to have such an incredible lineup for the launch of our new Spirituality and Religion and Palliative Care Special Interest Group for the PCRC. So let me tell you a little bit about both our speakers and our discussants. First, Shelley Varner Perez is Research Chaplain at Indiana University Health in Indianapolis, Indiana. She's also an affiliated research scientist with the IU Center for Aging Research at the Regan Street Institute in Indianapolis, as well as the faculty for the Daniel F. Evans Center for Spiritual and Religious Values in Healthcare at IU Health. She's a transforming chaplaincy research fellow graduate and formerly served as a staff chaplain in the Veterans Affairs Administration. Daniel Grossamy is a full-time pediatric palliative care researcher at the Hasslinger Family Pediatric Palliative Care Center at Akron Children's Hospital. Prior to this role, he did research on psychosocial and spiritual factors that influence treatment adherence in cystic fibrosis and was a board certified chaplain for 26 years. In his spare time, he plays the viola. Paul Galshute is a research chaplain with M Health Fairview. And prior to becoming a transforming chaplaincy research fellow, he was an inpatient palliative care chaplain at the University of Minnesota Medical Center for 10 years. Paul remains connected with the transforming chaplaincy as the convener for the Hospice Palliative Spiritual Care Research Network and also serves as the instructor for Research Literacy 101. Dr. Betty Farrell is well known to many of you as she is the director of our caregiver core for the Palliative Care Research Cooperative and is the professor and chair of the Division of Nursing Research at City of Hope Medical Center. She's conducted numerous studies and training programs related to spiritual care. Lexi Tork is a Torkey is a professor of medicine and associate division chief of general internal medicine and geriatrics at Indiana University School of Medicine. She's director of the Evans Center for Religious and Spiritual Values in Healthcare and a research scientist with the Indiana University Center for Aging Research at the Rigan Street Institute. Dr. Torkey's research focuses on spiritual, religious, and ethical communication and communication aspects of medical decision making for older adults. She practices outpatient palliative care at IU Health Methodist Hospital. And last but certainly not least, as co-lead for the uh, Spirituality and Religion Special Interest Group, George Fichette is a professor in the Department of Religion, Health and Human Values at Rush University Medical Center. He's the co-founder and director of Transforming Chaplaincy, whose mission is to promote evidence-based spiritual care and integrate research into spiritual care practice and education. And I will turn over the panel to him to start us off today. Thank you. Christine, thank you so much. Uh, friends, uh, we're really uh, delighted to have all of you join us for this uh, uh, webinar that uh, kicks off the Religion Spirituality Special Interest Group in the Palliative Care Research uh, Cooperative. Um, uh, we know that a lot of you uh, have an interest in religion spirituality, would have an interest in uh, better integrating uh, research about religion spirituality into your clinical practice and into your research. And we hope that the SIG becomes uh, an opportunity for those who share those interests to come together, to meet each other, to network, to brainstorm, uh, and to uh, strengthen um, uh, an evidence-based approach to uh, care for the religious and spiritual issues uh, of the patients and families that we're all serving. So um, we welcome you to join our SIG. Um, uh, send us an email. Uh, we'll get you on our mailing list. Uh, we're beginning regular meetings. Um, uh, we're getting acquainted with each other. Uh, we're beginning to brainstorm uh, some collaborative research uh, activities. Um, and uh, we're also uh, looking at developing resources that we can post on the PCRC website. So uh, those of you who are interested um, in uh, including best practices uh, and approaches to religion and spirituality in your research and clinical practice can do that. Uh, so we're really uh, glad to be able to come together to kind of kick off the SIG today. And as we do that, uh, we want to uh, both express our appreciation to Christine and the other co-leaders of the PCRC, as well as to the uh, National Institute for Nursing Research that uh, has provided such generous support for uh, the PCRC. 
And I think that's um, uh, all I need to say by way of welcome to the SIG. Um, and and Shelley, um, I think we're ready to turn it over to you for the first of our three uh, brief presentations. Thank you, George. It's a privilege to be with you today. You all can hear me okay? Excellent. So I'm going to be presenting a work in progress of a three phase mixed method study, the Chaplin led postcode debrief. And before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Portland, Oregon Veterans Affairs critical care team for the joint effort refining code debriefs there and my previous role. Next slide, please. I do want to thank our funding source, the Evans Center. Next slide. And I'd also like to highlight the research study team that I'm working with. Next slide, please. So what do we know about cardiopulmonary resuscitation events colloquially called code blues? So codes are highly stressful events. Anecdotally, at my current hospital, debriefs occur infrequently and inconsistently. In the past, most debriefing here has been technical, and one identified barrier is lack of physician training, contributing to lack of physician comfort leading debriefs. So this study is a development and trial of a chaplain-led postcode debrief tool to complement the technical debrief. Next slide, please. Just a word about study design. This is a three-phase study. Uh, we completed phase one data collection and we begin testing next week. Uh, today, I will share preliminary data from the observation period. Next slide, please. We have event inclusion and staff inclusion criteria. Um, for the event, the code must occur on an inpatient unit um, and greater than one minute of chest compressions must be administered on the patient um, who is at least 18 years old of age um, or older. Um, inclusion for our staff, the staff must be employees and actively involved in the code event. You can see here um, those criteria. Next slide, please. So for recruitment, our study chaplains um, respond to the code location and assess for event inclusion. Then they approach staff as staff exit the code room. They provide a brief introduction to the study and if staff are Initially interested, um, staff can complete a recruitment slip, which is a half page long. I'll show you an example in a moment. Um, staff will then be emailed a link to REDCap um, with a study information sheet for the e-consent process. And then if they consent, the time one survey becomes available. Next slide, please. This is our half page recruitment slip. It's brief given considerations for clinical flow. Next slide, please. So these are the final enrollment counts for our phase one observation period. We had 108 that we approached, 82 were eligible, 44 completed the one week survey. Of those 44 for that one week survey, 37 also completed our six week survey. We're excited, we exceeded our sample goal of 30 and we had high retention of our six week survey respondents um, at 84% um, from our one week. For upcoming phases, we do plan to use a program called Twilio to text the survey link. We know that we have busy clinicians and we hope this will improve our one week response rate as well as lessen survey burden. Next slide, please. So a bit about demographic items for these one week participants in the middle column. I do want to point out that the far right column are for those retained at six weeks who also responded to the one week survey. We had a mean age of around 35. Majority of our respondents are female, a large majority are white race, and a small proportion identified as Hispanic or Latinx. Next slide, please. This study includes various disciplines, which is a novel aspect of our study. We have similar proportions of pharmacists, physicians, and respiratory th therapists that filled out the survey, and the largest proportion of participants are RNs. Next slide, please. In terms of demographics, we also wanted to know years in the profession. You can see that we have a range of how long people have been in their profession with the highest proportions in the first five years of their profession, followed by those with 11 to 15 years in the profession. Next slide, please. Now I wanna highlight our quantitative measures. Uh, this is the first time that the NASA task load index has been used to describe the task load of code events. So TLX is a measure of subjective workload within tasks. And these workload related factors include demands that are mental, physical, and temporal, as well as performance, effort, and frustration. Next slide, please. So participants reported lower median mental demand, physical demand, and effort when thinking about the code at six weeks. Temporal demand and performance held steady, um, but interestingly, 
uh, frustration was of particular interest because even though it was of lower prevalence, it is the only variable that showed increase at six weeks. So those numbers there, uh, the one week is 25 and the six week is 37. I'm sorry about that slide. Next slide, please. So the top histogram is our one week responses um, about that frustration item that we're gonna delve into a little bit more deeply. And the bottom is our six week responses on that frustration item. You can see the question wording here on the left hand side. So we can see that a minority of people feel frustrated, discouraged and irritated and it either persisted or got worse. Some might feel more frustrated, discouraged, or irritated at a later time point, which appears almost bimodal. And we're thinking that some people might just be over it, over the code, and some people might feel worse, though we need a larger sample size to test this. Next slide, please. So we wanted to delve more deeply into the individual frustration responses. So this graph provides a different, different visual um, with individual responses at one week and six weeks. The individual response is at one week plotted on the left side and six weeks plotted on the right side with a dotted line connecting these individual responses. Um, you'll notice a pretty prominent uh, dark green line through the middle of the screen um, showing this increase in frustration that we had noted. Next slide, please. We also were interested in anxiety and depression when thinking back to the code event. As you can see, the median scores at both time points were zero, which is normal. Uh, there were individual respondents who did report moderate anxiety and depression when thinking back to the code, however. Next slide, please. Uh, we were also interested in overall distress and moral distress. So as a um, way, means of defining overall distress can occur in a variety of situations when something emotionally upsetting has occurred, like witnessing a death. In contrast, moral distress has particular defining characteristics, such as, quote, knowing the ethically correct thing to do, but being prevented from acting on that perceived obligation, end quote. And that's Woeschel and Weaver, which is a citation at the bottom of the slide. I think of moral distress as a different degree and complexity of distress than overall distress. So if we look here at these responses, and again, I'm sorry about the um, slide format there, um, compared to the one week responses, both overall distress and moral distress were reported to be lower at six weeks. Higher overall distress scores were seen at one week compared to moral distress at the same time point. So we're seeing that a minority of respondents did report moderately high moral distress here we're concerned about moral residue, which is any level of moral distress building on itself over time. Next slide, please. Because spirituality and religion can be protective, we included a one item on spiritual peace and that's Steinhauser and colleagues work. Our median score for participants is consistent with being quite a bit at peace at the one week post event and completely at peace six weeks post. A minority, however, reported being at peace only a little bit or a moderate amount, suggesting some room for improvement with a subset of our sample. So we also conducted phone interviews um, with 22 participants from that one week survey. Our median duration of those was 16 minutes. Um, we're in the early stages of our analysis using a modified grounded theory approach. Um, and here are some of the emotional and spiritual concerns we're finding and we'll be especially aware of these in our intervention. Stress has become a really prominent theme. Um, so um, one slide back, please. Thank you. So uh, hearing from a registered nurse um, responded, depending on your role, there's a different stress level, I would say. If you're doing compressions, if they medicate them, you give recommendations on which medications to give. Recording, it's a stressful job because you're yelling out things. And then from a pharmacist, I think it's a little hectic. There's a lot of pressure to get things right the first time. And I feel like there's sometimes pressure to get things done quickly. You have to get it done quickly and you have to get it done right. And it's a very high tense situation where people are all doing something different. You have to find what is your role. Next slide, please. And so although it seems like our main theme was intensity and adrenaline, when you dig in, you find these other emotions that could be sources of long-term distress for clinicians. I'm just gonna highlight part of these quotes. So, and then in terms of some codes just in their nature tend to be longer and drawn out, it's very, very hard to get that person back. These codes can be a bit more intense because you seem to be um, more and more in vain as you're going down your list of things to try and correct and it can feel defeating. Um, we also asked about COVID responses, the uncertainty, the unknown is so overwhelming with how sick these patients get and knowing that they're somebody's loved one or could potentially be one of us too. 
Uh, next slide. Next slide. Um, and we are looking forward to incorporating these themes into our pilot testing of the debrief tool. Thank you for your time and attention. Kelly, thanks for an interesting, uh, a very interesting project and for um, uh, and taking us through that um, so uh, effectively and efficiently. Appreciate that. Um, some people have been wondering, uh, will we have access to the slides and the recordings? And the answer is yes, they'll be on the PCRC website and we'll be sure that everyone gets a link to that so that you can um, see that. Uh, Daniel, I think you're up next. Daniel, you're on mute. That would help. Thank you again for having me. I'm presenting a, a grant proposal called Hear My Voice Adolescent, Reducing Mental Health Comorbidities for Adolescent Cancer Survivors by Making Meaning of Survivorship. Next slide, please. Be glad to have any feedback, but I'm particularly interested in two types of feedback. The subsequent trial from what we're proposing will require us to use a control group of some sort I'm interested in thoughts as alternatives to simply usual care. And also how to talk about innovation um, beyond we are adapting something to an entirely new population and the innovation of meaning making itself as the intervention target. Next slide, please. The RFA to which we're responding is an R21 with a clinical trial from National Cancer Institute looking to develop studies to reduce comorbidities uh, for pediatric adolescent and young adult cancer survivors. Um, if you'd hit the space bar, there we are. Um, the three points for responsive proposals, um, we are focusing on 15 to 19 year old subset in the adolescent survivor population, 15 being the low end that NCI sets for adolescent and 19 being the upper end of an adolescent definition from the World Health Organization. And within the um, psychosocial comorbidities, we're seeking to address depressive symptoms and anxiety. And there were six domains that applications should address. We're addressing the sixth one, which is to develop a targeted intervention to reduce the burden for survivors. Next slide. Our preliminary data um, comes from Kate Pitterman's work. Uh, Kate is a chaplain at Mayo Clinic who developed Hear My Voice, which is a legacy intervention, a semi-structured interview that develops uh, a spiritual meaning of what it has meant um, to live with a significant illness um, and demonstrated that that was acceptable and feasible to adults um, and also in a pilot study um, that it's potentially efficacious in reducing some mental health outcomes and improving quality of life. Next space bar. We were part of a foresight study of an advanced care planning trial with teens with cancer. Um, and as part of that, looked at a number of variables and learned that meaning making mediated the relationship between the adolescents religious and spiritual beliefs and practices and their depressive symptoms and anxiety and that's really what drove um, this whole grant idea um, that we focus on meaning making and by focusing on that hope to change the mental health outcomes um, and then from our own internal work, we have a manuscript under review showing that legacy documents, legacy interventions with pediatric and adolescent patients are both feasible and acceptable. Next slide, please. We're following the NIH orbit model for developing behavioral interventions. Um, our first aim helps us finish out phase one in the design part and begin preliminary testing with a proof of concept trial. Next slide. Here my voice is theoretically grounded, um, drawing extensively on Crystal Park's work in meaning making and spirituality and health outcomes. And um, Kate Pitterman, in which she developed Here My Voice, used um, heavily work of Harvey Chokanov in dignity therapy. Um, so that's our that's our theoretical grounding. Next slide. So our study team, as I mentioned, we're working quite closely with Kate Pitterman from Mayo. Maureen Lyon is a um, interventionist with extensive experience in doing trials with adolescents with cancer from Children's National Hospital. Rhonda Sesniak, biostatistician who's consulting on doing longitudinal mediation analysis um, to help out our internal biostatistician. 
we don't anticipate any recruitment issues. We have far more um, eligible teens than we need to recruit, but just in case, we do have a backup plan and an arrangement with Justin Baker from St. Jude Research Hospital to be able to do some recruiting there should that become necessary. Next slide, please. Our first aim is really making sure that the adaptation of Hear My Voice that we've done really is suitable to adolescent cancer survivors. Um, and so to do that, the first part of AIM-1, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll do a series of focus groups. Um, and if people are unable to attend, participate in a focus group, we'll do an individual key inform and interview. But the intention is to do two focus groups with adolescent cancer survivors. Um, the composition and recruitment will use stratified randomization so that we get a, a good balance of gender, race, and solid tumor versus blood cancer type. They'll have a chosen family support person to be part of the intervention with them. In the FACE trial with advanced care planning, they typically chose a parent, but sometimes it was a grandparent or a sibling, and in some cases, a boyfriend or girlfriend. Um, so it's, it's their family support person, however they choose to define them. One of the things we wanna talk about is the extent to which they want their family support person going through the intervention with them. Daniel, I think you got on mute again. I think I must have. So after we do that, next slide, please. We will um, make any necessary revisions to the intervention, to the manual of procedures, and then beta test it with three adolescent family member dyads just to make sure that it truly is suitable for this population. It's understandable. Um, and also provides us an opportunity to verify our interventionist fidelity to the interview guide. Next slide, please. And then for AIM-2, we'll do a treatment only proof of concept design enrolling 30 adolescent family member dyads who were not enrolled in the first AIM. Also using stratified randomization, um, collecting data at baseline and then two weeks post intervention and three weeks post intervention. Next slide, please. As I say, we have more than enough. We have 310 eligible adolescents and this shows somewhat of the race ethnic and cancer type breakdown. Um, since we only need to recruit 30, um, that's only 10%, so I think we'll be fine. Next slide, please. Our primary outcomes using PROMISE measures as the scales, depressive symptoms, and anxiety, and our secondary outcomes primarily deal with feasibility and acceptability and safety. Next slide, please. And then the primary analysis, as I said, is a longitudinal mediation analysis to look at the at the extent to which meaning making mediates the relationship between their spiritual and religious beliefs and practices and depressive symptoms and anxiety. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. Daniel, that was great. Thanks uh, uh, so much. Um, uh, friends, just a reminder that um, if you have <clears throat> questions, um, for our presenters, um, things you'd like to share, um, you can put them in the Q&A uh, as we go along here. Um, and Paul Galshut, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, George, and thanks to everybody who's tuning in and to those who, of course, watch this later. And I also want to wish everybody a happy Nurses Week as well. So I want to talk a little bit about a study that we did um, about a year ago. It involved um, 10 inpatient uh, chaplain being interviewed for um, the experience of what it was like for them to see COVID through the patient family experience as well as the staff support lens. And doing this work with me, I wanna give a nod to Tim Usset as well as Dirk Labochin and so grateful for their partnership as well as the 10 inpatient palliative care chaplain colleagues who kindly agreed to be our research participants. Next slide, please. So I took a screenshot of the COVID dashboard put up by our colleagues at Johns Hopkins. And this is where we were halfway through the interviews that were conducted. Um, seems remarkable to say that we just were cresting over 60,000 deaths here in the United States. Next slide, please. So I wanna tell you a little bit about uh, these 10 chaplains. 
We wanted to try to make sure that we were able to cover a bit of the United States. So there is at least one chaplain in each of the four decennial census regions of the United States. Uh, we're a little more heavily weighted on this particular sample with people in the Northeast, but that's who we have, the West, the Midwest, the Northeast, and the South. And just to tell you a little bit about um, this group, uh, they were evenly split as people who identified as male or female by gender. Seven were Christian, five identified as white, the average age was about 41, and they approached about four years of experience, and it, and it also heavily weighted toward an academic medical center um, place of context of work. Next slide, please. So this was our research question that drove our interview guide. What are those unique practice-based insights of inpatient palliative care chaplains during a pandemic? Next slide, please. So we got so much data that we're able, we think, to have two manuscripts. So what you'll be seeing is primarily related to the patient family experience and some of the themes. We're not gonna um, uh, show all the sub themes just because of time, but wanna give you a sampling of that. And at the end, we'll just see, give you a sense of where we're going with the staff support data. So many of us who of course lived through this know that the visitor restrictions though necessary had a uh, a pulverizing emotional effect. And the way that we identified this is it was an emotional cauldron. Almost all the words we heard about the patient family experience, of course, were, were for the most part negative. Another thing that we heard was the sense that we can't see what's happening. Um, and of course, that makes it even more distressing, especially amid people experiencing serious illness. And what does that mean to have them experience especially in lieu of COVID in the early days, uh, rapid um, functional decline uh, with somebody's clinical circumstances. And uh, we also saw them remark on what it meant to influence non-COVID dying. One story that stood out for me was a chaplain reporting on a, a younger man dying of cancer who probably would have been surrounded by family, uh, had one person that was allowed to be there uh, amid the restrictions and you know, quote, didn't seem right. And this quote, I uh, just want to leave this before leaving this slide that uh, also stood out that for the people uh, involved in having themselves or loved ones amidst this experience of COVID, accepting that they can't be there with them when they're dying is even worse than accepting that they are dying. Next slide, please. So being chaplains, we wanted to ask about religious struggle and what kind of, uh, how they saw that emerge through their lens. Uh, they reported that that sense of religious struggle was experienced to be more intense, that that sense of punishment was also a bit more attenuated, and that as the sense of punishment and intensity increased, commensurately also did that sense of coping. This quote, I think I've done more prayers now than ever because family members are disconnected and so many people don't know what to turn to because the coping and supports they did have, this pandemic was so instant that they're trying to still put those pieces together. Next slide, please. So um, I'm somebody who likes to differentiate religious struggle from spiritual distress. Um, so when we were in the process of coding, uh, this is some of what we saw emerge for this theme and, and sub themes that um, feeling untouchable was a part of that, especially amid these restrictions. In fact, the first manuscript that we're gonna be putting out, I think the title will be something like Feeling Untouched and Untouchable. The chaplains also reported having people have a desire for constant reassurance and that they wanted people to check in with their loved one to give them an update and see how their family was doing spiritually and emotionally, and that they just wanna know that they're not suffering and not feeling alone. Next slide, please. This one also emerged for us, um, decision-making. That families felt like they were um, giving up because they weren't there, that they were incapable of deciding, almost paralyzed in that process. And because they couldn't see, they didn't trust the team making those decisions. So um, not being able to be present or observe for themselves what was going on, it felt like there was that level of suspicion or mistrust towards the team. Next slide, please. So the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine had a poster session that we were able to submit to, and this was the poster. Um, some of this area I've already covered. Um, it's gonna invite, next slide, please. 
So this is just a teaser to let you know that we're working on a second paper as well. And these are some of our big themes and just want to leave some quotes um, with you uh, that we want to know about burnout. And so I'll read this. I think one of the I think the one I've seen most related to burnout is just a loss of community. We're a very close integrated palliative care team. We see each other a lot and we work with each other a lot. We support each other. And so when we lost that physical presence of each other, everyone was grieving that loss. And then I'll just read this uh, moral distress quote to you as well and be uh, wrap up my slides. It was this sort of well-intentioned but horrendous side effect where we essentially say to families without actually meeting this, if you only transition your loved one to comfort measures, We'll let you come and spend so much time. Um, we'll spend as much time with them with you as, as you want. Thank you so much for letting me uh, be a part of this. Next slide, please. And uh, would love to have you join the Hospice Palliative Spiritual Care Research Network with Transforming Chaplaincy. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, I appreciate that. Um, kind of second Paul's uh, invitation, uh, Transforming Chaplaincy is a network of chaplains and others who are trying to kind of strengthen spiritual care through evidence-based practice. And uh, there'll be a lot of overlap uh, between what we do in the SIG and through Transforming Chaplaincy. And we look forward to that partnership. Betty, I think we're ready to turn it over to you um, uh, for some conversation discussion. And let me remind people again if you have questions uh, do put them in the Q&A. Betty? Great well thank you so much I've been given a few minutes to at least make some comments about these three wonderful presentations that we've just heard. Before I do that I just want to say that I think today is a really amazing day for the palliative care research cooperative because this SIG really benefits not only chaplains and those who are interested in spiritual care research as a primary area, but it's a big step forward for all palliative care researchers because all of us um, can benefit by incorporating spirituality as a part of our science. And we certainly can benefit by collaborating with our spiritual care colleagues. And so there's just so many ways that palliative care research and our evidence base can be made much stronger by supporting this kind of research. And these three presentations are really the showcase for why this is so important. So I'll just make a few comments in a way as I reviewed the slides before today and then listened to these presentations. I did try to kind of put on my study section reviewers uh, hat and think about if I was someone reviewing these proposals or um, you know, for future research, what might be some things that I would think about so I'll start with Shelley. I think your presentation about um, this chaplaincy-led post-code debrief is beyond amazing. It's incredible. And if you think about for how many years and how many codes have we failed to really pause and ask these questions. So it, this is really so valuable. Um, I think your study is also a reminder that our research in palliative care is about patients and families facing serious illness, but it should be also equally about the staff who care for these patients and families. And I can really see a long program of research ahead for you and your colleagues, because there's so much for us to learn about, for example, the family perspective after the code, um, the staff perspective, perspective after the code. I think, um, this is of course one of many examples of the lessons we've learned from the COVID pandemic and that this really caused all of us to pause and think about the impact of what we were doing. If I were putting on my uh, study section reviewer hat, I would immediately think about the innovation. I think what you're doing is very innovative and that reviewers will find this as a, an area that really warrants a lot more research. I'd be really interested in hearing more about the conceptual basis of your work. Is there a conceptual model guiding your study? There are a number of different lenses that I can see applying to this work, but I'd like to know more about that because I think knowing the conceptual framework that's guiding you would help us to really think about what variables that you're measuring and really understand just the lens in which you see this experience of uh, postcode debrief. And I also think your research is a wonderful example of mixed methods that um, there's such a need to not only hear the stories and have qualitative data about 
the clinician's experiences post code, but there's also a real need to mirror that with a lot of quantitative data. So I was really pleased to, to hear about your phone interviews. And um, I think there's probably a great depth beyond the brief phone interviews to really understand the impact on staff. Um, I also will just say that, you know, one of the things uh, on study sections and things that I'm a part of now that I'm hearing more than ever is that the NIH is interested in testing interventions that are generalizable and feasible, right? That we're really beyond major funders, whether that be foundations or the government, uh, devoting large sums of research dollars uh, to test interventions that really cannot be made uh, you know, applicable across settings. So I think you have a great opportunity to create very generalizable interventions that are also feasible and also to really demonstrate that it, it is so important to be thinking about interprofessional care and the role of chaplaincy. So great work. Um, I'll move on to Daniel. I think uh, Daniel, the, your very first slide, you had me because I've been a long, long-term interest in this uh, where the worlds of survivorship care and palliative care really come together. And I think there's great opportunities that we've only begun to explore about the application of palliative care for cancer survivors. Your study is the perfect example of what the R21 is intended for, that the R21 is to establish feasibility of interventions and to look at initial efficacy. I was pleased to see that part of your what you're proposing with this R21 is looking at the effect size. And so that you're being very thoughtful about what you could accomplish in the R21 that would really prepare for a very strong R01 application. <clears throat> I also think that your work is a great example of taking work that is well established, such as dignity therapy, and applying it to new populations. Um, as I think about your R21 plans and that ultimately then, you know, I always say there's one and only one reason you would do an R21 and that is to support an R01. So now is the time to be thinking what's going to be in that R01. And so I was interested in your primary outcomes being depression and anxiety. And um, I did hear you talk about what factors might be associated with spiritual care outcomes. But as you develop this work, I will be very interested in hearing more about the spiritual care components um, in addition to those psychological outcomes. And so what are the aspects of spirituality, of existential aspects of religiosity, um, and how do those then impact other aspects of health? But this is a great path of the R21 onto the R01. And then finally, Paul, um, I, just, I just love your study. I love everything about it. Um, I've done work for, for many years and I can remember probably going back about 20 years ago when I started doing some work about chaplaincy and about spiritual care. One of the first findings was most clinicians had very little understanding of the role of chaplain. They didn't know what chaplains do was sort of the common thing. And, um, so I think your work is so important because we really need a lot more insight of the experience of chaplaincy, the role of chaplaincy. And I think understanding the role of chaplaincy and the experiences of chaplaincy will also just shed light to our greater understanding of spirituality. I think in fact, you know, the pandemic as you've acknowledged has really shed, shed a lot of light on um, what it is like to be facing you know, this acute serious illness and seeing that from the view of you know, many people, the family member at home, the uh, clinicians alone, you know, without family present, and of course chaplains spending as much time supporting staff as patients. So um, there's another big national committee I'm a part of right now, and we frequently have used the phrase, don't waste a good pandemic. And so I think that's, um, that's probably a message for all the presenters today that we've had this really horrendous pandemic, but the pandemic has also opened our eyes to questions that we haven't been asking in the past, and now is the time to be asking these questions. So 
very, very interested in your work. I will say um, that across presentations, but particularly your presentation, Paul, I'm really intrigued with how you will begin to look at cultural factors and diversity, because certainly, you know, the, the cultural diversity of chaplains, of the people that they serve, the you know, issues of diversity surrounding spiritual beliefs um, and experiences will be so important, as will be the diversity of the staff and the patients and the family. But I think each of these three studies represents just a huge building block that when these studies are done, I feel very confident that they're gonna move the field ahead. And also I listen to all three of you and I can think of so many studies being done by social workers and nurses and physicians that would benefit so greatly by having you at the table. And so I hope that everyone hearing these presentations today um, has, have also been thinking about ways to foster this collaboration. So thank you for sharing your work. It's really remarkable. Betty, thanks so much uh, for your thoughtful comments, for bringing us into the study section and, and helping us uh, think uh, uh, in a critical way and, and for your generous comments. Uh, really uh, delighted that you can be here with us uh, as we kick this off. Lexi, we're, we're doing a great job staying on time, so I'm counting on you. Uh, go ahead. That's all right. I'll have to talk very slowly. Um, well, I really appreciate the three presentations um, and Betty's comments. And so um, I'll give just a couple, I think she did such a wonderful job of summarizing and bringing out some really key elements of the three um, proposal or the three projects, um, and then thinking about how they move forward. So I'll just make a couple of points about that. Um, and then we'll make some general comments um, up kind of about the direction of the field. Um, so um, for Daniel, you had asked a couple of questions. Um, that I think are kind of related in an interesting way, um, which is that I really think that your innovation of, um, well, two things that you pointed out. One is the concept of meaning making as an intervention. And um, I really think that in both the literature about our patients' experience and illness, and even in the literature about clinicians, we are undervaluing the importance of meaning um, and the importance of purpose. And it's just starting to come to the fore. Um, as something that is an important, can be an important cause of suffering, but can also be an important cause of healing. Um, and so I actually think that's very exciting. Um, I do wonder if you have any way to kind of measure that intermediate outcome. Um, and I joined Betty in, in thinking about um, what the, the outcome of meaning making might be, and if there might be things in addition to depression and anxiety that might result um, from coming out of a serious illness with um, a sense of meaning or, 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 or not. Um, you also asked about the control group, and this is such a tough one, and it's such a combination of thinking about what's scientifically right and guessing what reviewers will want. And since you can't do the latter, I think you have to focus on the former, um, which is to think that your control group, um, it needs to be similar in some ways, but shouldn't, how do I put this, um, needs to control for things like the human attention or the time or the thinking, but should not include your kind of secret sauce or key ingredient, which I think in this case is um, the process of meaning making through this exercise. Um, so I think the question is, are there other potential effects on your outcome that you need to control for um, that you could do um, with some kind of attention control? Or is that not really something that theoretically you need to worry about and so a usual care group would be okay? Um, and I just think a good justification of how you make that choice will be the most important thing. And frankly, that's all you can control. Um, and speaking of meaning, in Paul's work, um, I just thought that the descriptions of um, the descriptions of the family struggling with not being able to see what's happening um, really resonated with me and my experience working in the hospital during the pandemic. Um, and there were a couple of, of kind of concepts that I thought um, were interesting. It is so hard to come to terms with what's happening if you can't um, see it. And it relates um, to a couple of kind of theoretical concepts. One is the concept of sense making, which I've just always been really fascinated with, which is that when we go into a new environment, we try to make sense of the environment. And that's so important for our cognitive processing, but also just for our emotional well being. Um, and if you're, you're trying to come to terms with both the illness of a family member as well as potentially their death, that must be so hard if you can't see anything about what's going on. And then the second is trust in the healthcare system and in providers. 
And um, I think one of the ways that we establish trust is that we watch what people do and see if it matches what they say. And in this environment, you have absolutely no way to judge what the clinicians are doing to your family member. Um, and so what a hard way um, to cope with trust. Um, I'm excited about Shelley's work too, although I'm much more close to it. Um, I think it's really exciting. And so I don't probably have as, as much feedback to give, except I do look forward to it being um, expanded and disseminated and really um, want to support her in that endeavor. Um, kind of for my maybe last couple of minutes, I do want to talk about um, the fact that, um, you know, I think that it, this um, SIG is exciting on both the fronts of all of us at the PCRC getting to learn more about how to do quality research and incorporate religion and spirituality, whatever our primary topic. Um, but I think it's very exciting that we wound up with three chaplain presenters. Um, and I think the growth in the field of chaplains as researchers has been a wonderful thing um, and has really taken off um, in the last few years. Um, and that's been due to a number of factors, but transforming chaplaincy under George Fischette's leadership has certainly been a key factor. Um, and so I am excited to be welcoming more chaplains into the PCRC um, and watching um, our chaplain colleagues um, grow as researchers. And um, you know, I think these are early projects that have great potential to grow um, into large scale projects. Along those lines is the funding. And um, I want to say that um, I think we really are at a point where it's time to um, look at large scale trials um, that may be funded in part by foundations, but especially by organizations like the NIH. Um, it is fundamentally patient centered. Um, it is something patients need and want. Um, it is incredibly important for palliative care. And um, I think the time is right um, to make this a focus both by applying through typical mechanisms and I hope at some point having some mechanisms that relate to spiritual care. Um, and we'd love to talk about it with anyone in the SIG as we move forward about how to do that. Um, so I will stop there and look forward to some great question and answer. Uh, Lexi, thanks so much. Uh, I really appreciate that. Um, I, I want to give um, uh, Paul, Shelley, Daniel a, a minute in case you want to respond to anything Betty said or Lexi has said. I do want to kind of note one of the questions in the Q&A for Daniel uh, kind of echoed something Betty said, and that was, um, you know, whether or not there was um, uh, a way to have a more diverse population um, in your um, trial. Um, uh, um, but um, the three of you, uh, comments, responses, things you'd like to say? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Trying to copy notes and, and keep these thoughts uh, for the days ahead as I'm finishing writing this up. So appreciate both of your comments. Thank you. While you're still on mute, Shelley, I'll, I'll just, I'll be your echo, Daniel. I so appreciate that. And to any time to have people of your caliber, Betty and Lexi, it's a, it's a gift that you're able to hear and look at our work. So thank you very much. George, if I could just, go ahead, go Shelley. And then, yeah. I just wanted to say, um, in each of your presentations, you all did a wonderful job of identifying sort of next steps. I know, Daniel, you had a comment about what do I do with the control group in my next study? And so I really wanted to mention the PCRC, if you're not familiar with all the resources, but the PCRC has cores and the cores are intended to have um, people that can provide free consultation to you. And so there are, I chair the caregiver core along with Nick Dion Odom, but there's methods and measurement core, data informatics. So talking to a statistician the statisticians of the PCRC are the best I've ever worked with in my whole career, clinical studies core. So if you're, whoever you are out there, um, if you, you know, if you feel like you could just, your work could benefit by getting some input on your study design or what tools do I use or, you know, what, what analysis do I do, the PCRC is a wonderful resource for you. Thank you, Betty. Shelley, did you have something? 
was just going to say, um, with regard to diversity of our sample, I'm aware that there was not a lot of racial diversity, and I'm working with the healthcare system to see if our sample mirrors the population that we're working with, um, and thinking more about that possibility as well. And uh, also, thank you for the encouragement to um, further articulate my conceptual model. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Shelley. Um, um, we have uh, uh, the Zoom has an opportunity to raise your hand, and uh, I understand uh, Kai Okada has raised her hand, and that Naomi may be able to let you. Um, Kai may be able to let you um, his hand. I'm sorry, please. If you have a question, can Naomi unmute you? Um, while we're waiting, um, uh, Paul, uh, Chuck Valenti Hine um, uh, in Ascension has kind of um, asked, I wonder if the use of virtual tools to bridge the isolation you noted was commented on uh, by the chaplains. Um, we've, we've seen a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah. It, yes, very much so. Thanks, Chuck. Good to, uh, good to have you here. And it was, I think the short answer is it was a curse and a blessing, uh, blessing that it allowed connections, but um, being any of us who have been a part of a care conference or uh, you have these really sensitive moments where you're talking about goals of care. And so it was uh, quite difficult to have that occur because some people weren't facile with the technology, especially in the early days. And it made these really sensitive, profoundly emotional conversations uh, disjointed and hard. And yeah, there were stories about chaplains running around with smartphones and tablets and and seeking as best as possible to make those connections. So yeah, it did very much feature into that. Um, and given time, couldn't report on that data, but thanks Chuck for asking the question. I see another question in the Q and A. Is it okay if I read that out? From Me Mia too. Baumgartner. Um, Paul, how do you define the difference between religious struggle and spiritual distress? And do you include existential distress or struggle under spiritual distress? Is this going to be an afternoon seminar? <laughs> I just, my, again, great to have their question. Uh, I hope you are well. Um, it's a great question. And I, we specifically in our interview guide went after that. And thankfully, our palliative care chaplains that were asked to be a part of this, uh, they just swung for the fences on this. They just kept going with it. They didn't say, hey, can you define that for me? In fact, we didn't define it for the palliative care chaplains in the interview guide because it was a pilot sort of exploratory kind of study. Now, if they wanted to prompt uh, the interview guide allowed for that to occur. But yeah, so for me, religious struggle would, you know, thinking, Ken Pargament, Julie Exline kind of pieces, like when you're thinking sacred um, and spiritual distress, lean heavily on the, I think it's the Calderia paper, forgive me for not doing pronunciation, but the 2013 paper, and then the Rose Ordonius uh, papers, uh, Sheen Sinclair's worked on some of that as well. Um, so that's where I lean with spiritual distress. And I also, of course, go back to the consensus white paper definition and boiling it down to meaning connection purpose. And if those things are disruptive or distressing, I certainly you know, cast that in that. But you're right, the ex ex existential piece, um, I haven't found for me what's like, what's the best, you know, consensus definition for what's out there. And um, I think all of us could have a really good conversation. And that's really where I think a good afternoon seminar could be possible. But thank you for the question. Also, there's a note by Wayne Ciboli of a, of a um, reference uh, that uh, talks about the comprehensive measure of meaning uh, that's also in the Q&A. Uh, uh, Kay Okada, I wonder if you can unmute yourself. You have the capability if you're able to unmute to ask your question. Uh, I don't have any particular question. I'm just enjoying the whole presentation and trying to digest everything. So much information. So thank you. Okay, great. Uh, there is another uh, uh, question in the chat uh, about mercy uh, and uh, mercy being expected by providing the materials. Yes, uh, the, the webinars are all available on the uh, PCRC website. It's palliativecareresearch.org. And if you go to the Investigator Development Center tab, 
you'll see all the webinars archived there. So hope that helps you, um, Uzoma. There's a good question in the chat that I'll answer kind of in a general way. Can you remind us what R01 and R21 mean? And you know, it's the alphabet soup um, that the NIH uses to designate different kinds of grants. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, so an RO, R21 is kind of um, a small preliminary grant and an R01 is usually a larger project grant, um, but there are Ks and Ps and all kinds of grants. Um, and I do think that one of the things that, um, you know, the PCRC can do is that there are so many people within the PCRC who are experts in navigating the um, NIH um, and, um, and its funding mechanisms. Um, I do, so I'd encourage people to come to the annual meeting and by come, you know, like this year it was virtual and maybe in the future we'll be able to be together. Um, but I think learning that, learning what, um, uh, what you're proposing, where it fits in um, to the NIH mechanisms, um, how to respond um, to particular calls for proposals that might be relevant for your work, and then how to find collaborators that have the right kind of expertise and everything from the topics you wanna to work in um, to grant writing um, and a track, a track record of, of funding are all important aspects of a successful grant. Um, the PCRC has lots of resources on its website and then the annual meeting is a great place to um, network with others. Are we, are, are we down to the last minute? One more comment, question? I, I, I do go see ahead, Lexi. More that maybe I can just um, read out from the chat, um, from, which is from a nurse scientist and ICU nurse, this is a crucial topic. How do you think this could be expanded and adapted into the ambulatory and community care centers, settings with community spiritual leaders? Um, and I wonder if any of you guys, um, any of the presenters have insights as to either the outpatient setting or the community setting. I'll jump in. I'm going to actually, I'll call it, yeah, Shelly's unmuting, so great. Yes, I so um, I, I um, tried to respond to this question already, and there are so many um, challenges with feasibility in an acute care setting with how quickly things move. I think the challenges are totally different in ambulatory care and community settings. Um, so I would say, um, um, let me peel one apple first, and then I'll work on another one. Maybe there are some, um, some um, concepts that will carry over. It's a great question. I think I'll make the comment that I th it seems like in my experience, a lot of chaplain care has been traditionally provided in the inpatient setting. And as medicine more and more moves to the outpatient setting, I think that's a challenge because some patients might go through a life-threatening illness or perhaps all the way to death without ever meeting a chaplain. And so if we don't get out there into the community where we're you know, in the outpatient setting, particularly for example, in cancer, um, we might miss the opportunity to care for patients who could really use spiritual care services. Yeah, there are some small pilot efforts uh, to move spiritual care into outpatient contexts and to study carefully who's most in need uh, of spiritual support in the outpatient center, how to make the best referrals, um, what kind of uh, spiritual care is supportive. Um, a few of them are getting ready to be published. It's an area where we need to kind of um, build up the research and perhaps kind of, you know, follow the example of the kind of incremental research that um, Daniel was showing us uh, around developing in, uh, small interventions and, and, and projects and then um, uh, building larger projects to kind of um, describe the need um, uh, offer the interventions, measure the interventions, expand them. Um, it is an area where chaplains are quite interested in, in, in working. Shelly, I know, just did a small review in the area, and we're eager to um, uh, be part of that. I think it's time to wrap up. Uh, thank you so much to everybody uh, for your participation, to our presenters, to our uh, respondents, Betty, uh, Lexi, uh, Christine, it was great to kick off here. Uh, we're looking forward to having people join us in the SIG and, and, and move this research forward. Uh, Naomi, we're going to turn it over to you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone uh, who's joined and to our incredible panel today. Um, if our attendees do go to our website, we have one more webinar posted for June, uh, in which we have doctors Krista Harrison, Alyssa Bernstein, and Sarah Garrett. 
presenting on data collection, analysis, and dissemination in dementia palliative care research and interdisciplinary qualitative collaboration. Uh, we hope you join us for that as well. And we'll also be sending out an evaluation where we gather other topics that you might be interested in learning more about. So please take a moment to fill that out. And in that email, I'll also attach instructions on how to sign up for the new Spirituality and Religion SIG through the PCRC. Um, so keep an eye out for that. And thanks so much for joining. Take care, everybody.